Okay, guys, so next one is 13. So in 13, um, this first sentence is actually important. If we took a look at our previous few examples, the first sentence was sort of filled with fluff. But here, there's some good information that we're going to need to use later in the first sentence. So in the figure, a 5-kilogram object is moving 5 meters per second along a horizontal frictionless surface towards an ideal springless, sorry, towards an ideal massless spring that is attached to a wall. So what that means is that this is not technically simple harmonic motion because the object is not attached to the spring, but the spring will store elastic potential energy, which is great. Um, we also know that the surface is frictionless, which yes, is physically impossible. Even ice has some value of friction, but they tell us it's frictionless. It makes our life easier, so we will move on. After the block collides with the spring, the spring is compressed a maximum distance of 0.68 meters. Okay, so what that means is that when the entire momentum of the object is transferred to the spring, it will compress from its equilibrium position to the right. 0.68 meters. So first, the block is sliding across the surface by itself. Then it collides with the spring, and all of its momentum is transferred to the spring, and the spring is compressed 0.68 meters. Then all of that energy that's stored in the spring due to its compression is transferred back to the block. There's no friction, so ideally, right, there's no energy loss to thermal energy. We specifically want to know the speed of the block when it has moved so that the spring is compressed to only one half its maximum displacement. So that means that the block is halfway between the max compression point and leaving the end of the spring. So the spring is compressed halfway, but the block still has kinetic energy. So we need to use a conservation of energy. And we're looking at snapshots, right? So energy is helpful because sometimes when the forces are too difficult to look at, we can get an accurate understanding of how the object reacts by looking at the energy before the interaction and after the interaction. So our before snapshot would be as it's moving across the frictionless surface before the collision. So it has only kinetic energy. At the midway point, right, which is our final situation, it has both elastic potential energy because the spring is compressed to one half its maximum compression, and it has some velocity, which we don't know. We need to figure that out. We know it should be less than five, right? But we don't know how much less than five. Okay, so we're gonna use conservation of energy. So before we have only kinetic energy, one half mv squared must be equal to the potential energy stored in the spring when it's compressed to half its maximum rate plus the kinetic energy of the box. We should see a problem here, which I have double underlined. Our issue is that we don't have our spring constant. They don't give that to us. But using the information that's given to us, meaning that we know the mass of the block and the maximum compression distance, we can use Hooke's law to find K. So this is a little bit of a trickier justification. So we can treat a horizontal spring mass system the same way we treat a vertical spring mass system if there's no friction. Because the only f applied force that would be causing the compression of the spring would be the weight of the object, right? Which again, it's technically impossible, but if there's no friction, that's what would occur. So our storing force is technically equal to the weight of our box, 
So we're told the mass is 5 kilograms. We multiply by 9.8 or 10. Okay, on the AP exam, they'll tell you to use 10 for G. And then we'll divide both sides by that maximum compression. And we get that K is 72.06 newtons per meter. Once we have K, we can now solve for our velocity. So we'll simplify left side of the equation. We get 62.5 joules is equal to 1 half times the spring constant times half the maximum compression. So if max compression is 0.68, um, that means that half of that, right, 0.34 meters. Don't forget to square it. Plus 1 half times the mass, which is 5 kilograms, times V squared. We need to solve for V squared. So we get about 14 or so. We subtract that from both sides. We get 58.3349 joules. We divide both sides by 5 kilograms and then multiply by 2. We get V squared equals 23.3339728 meters squared per second squared. Take the square root of both sides. We get 4.8 three meters per second. If you use 10 here for G, you'll get exactly that answer above. Okay, so that is number 13. Moving right along. Okay, so we're gonna talk about number 124. So this one isn't that tricky, it's just the diagram. So we did look at a previous example in which the, let me draw an image really quick, a different example. So don't look at 124 for a second. In a previous example that we did, right, we had a force below the, actually that might have been for my AP1 class getting them a little bit confused, but I, I believe that we already did this as an example. So there was an applied force that was below the x-axis, and we are given this angle here, theta. If theta is with the x-axis, we can use cosine theta to find the x-component. If, the, if theta is not measured with the x-axis, we can't use cosine to find the x-component, right? So here, this image, we're given theta measured with the y-axis, not the x. Annoying, I know. But we're smart, and we can use trig to figure that out quite easily. So we have a force applied to a block of mass m at a downward angle theta to the vertical as shown. The block moves with a constant speed. So no acceleration, cool. Across a rough floor for a distance x. The work done by the applied force on the block is, okay, so we know that work is force dot displacement. So we're taking the parallel component of the force, and we're multiplying by the displacement. What we mean by parallel, right? It's the component of the force that is parallel to the displacement vector, right? Displacement and the x component of the force would be parallel to each other. So we need the x component of the force. That x component causes that displacement. So in order to find work, we need to isolate the x component. To find the x component, right, if we make our little right triangle here, we have to use sine of theta to find the x component. So the x component will be f times the sine of theta, so the magnitude of the vector times the sine of theta will give us f sub x. If the angle we were given was with the x-axis, we could use cosine, right? So if we get, we're given this value for theta, we can use cosine, but we're not. So we cannot use cosine. We have to use the trig function based on that vector given to us. So the x component is what causes the work, causes that displacement, adds energy to the system, so we have to use the magnitude of the force times the sine of theta times the displacement. 
So the answer here is A. Okay, so that was a little bit tricky, but recalls your understanding of vectors. End trick. Okay. You and I just realized someone asked me about number 29, but there is no number 29. So we did 129. Maybe we need mean 28. So let's do 28. Okay, so number 28. An object of mass, four kilograms, starts at rest in the top of a rough inclined plane of height 10 meters, as shown in the figure. So there was no object in the figure, so I decided to put one in there. There's a donut with some blue frosting and red sprinkles. Um, a gluten-free donut, by the way. Um, also, the flower is white. Anyway, okay, so if the speed of the object at the bottom of the inclined plane is 10 meters per second, how much work does friction do to this object as it slides down the incline? So you see here, I have my equation ready to go. Work equals the force dot the displacement, which actually in the problem they call S, okay? We label the length of the incline S. In order to figure out the length of S, we need to use some trig. We know this angle is 30 degrees. We're given the height, which is 10 meters. So I'm going to use sine opposite over hypotenuse to find S. So I'm going to take 10, divide by the sine of 30 to get S by itself. And we get 20 meters. So 20 meters is the length of the incline. In order to find the work due to friction, we must first find the force of friction. So there are actually a few ways in which you could do this. So technically, you could use the idea of work due to friction equals change in mechanical energy, and you could do it that way. Um, or what you could do is find an expression using Newton's second law for the force of friction. Once you find the force of friction, you can use the work equation to find the work done by friction. Um, so I'm going to stick to that method. That's the method from the videos that I showed you guys, the flipping physics videos. Um, so I'm going to kind of stick with that. So technically, you have your, your free body diagram. You have your normal force, which is perpendicular to the incline. You have force of gravity, which points straight down, right? The angle between the y-axis and the vector would be 30. And then force of friction is straight along the plane of the incline. It's going to point opposite the direction of the displacement. So when we flip our axis, right, the normal force vector and the force of gravity vector will straighten out along the x. The force of gravity vector will flip down and to the left, and there will be an angle of 30 degrees between. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, the undo buttons it doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. This is going to be the best I do. The angle between the y axis and our vector is technically the angle of the incline 30 degrees. So to find a relationship for the force of friction, we have to sum the forces in the x and set them equal to m times a in the x. Force of friction will oppose the direction of acceleration, so it's going to be negative. The component of the force of gravity that will contribute to the acceleration, again, on the, on the AP exam, do not draw components of vectors on the free body diagram, but technically, if we were to draw it, right, it's located here. That would be the x component of that force of gravity, and it's parallel to the displacement. To find the x component, because theta is with the y, we need to use sine, right? Sine slides. x is always cosine, unless we're on an incline, sine slides. So to find the x component of the force of gravity, we have m times g times the sine of 30. 
and we're going to solve for force of friction. We do know the mass and we do know g, but we don't know the acceleration. So how are we going to find that? We're going to use kinematics. So technically, using kinematics here, these are technically all in the x. I should have that um, specified because there are multiple dimensions here. Let me fix that really quick. So the final velocity in the x squared times the final velocity, or sorry, the final velocity in the, the x squared equals the initial velocity in the x squared plus 2 times the acceleration in the x times the displacement, which technically here is s. We're told the final velocity is 10, so we're going to score 10, we get 100, and then 2 times 20 meters, we get 40 meters. Divide both sides by 40, we get that the acceleration is 2.5 meters per second squared. Okay, and we're going to plug that into the equation for force of friction and solve. And when I did that, I got negative 9.6 newtons. So the work should be negative because the force takes energy from the system, right? But technically, right, we said that force of friction was negative because it opposes the acceleration. So we solve for the force of friction, we shouldn't get a negative value. So what that means is that there's an algebra mistake. So what we have to do is go back and double check. Okay, so I noticed it before I started recording the video, but I just wanted to go back and show you guys um, so that we remember if we get a negative sign for a force when we already assigned it to be negative using Newton's second law, then something's wrong, right? Work can be negative because that negative sign means that that force took energy from the system but technically, right, if we assign the force to be negative, we can't get a negative value because that would mean that force of friction actually points down the incline, which we know is false, right? The friction is going to oppose the sliding motion of our donut down the incline. So what most likely happened, yep, that negative sign was right there. So if I add force of friction to the right side and subtract m times a over, this should actually be negative and this one's positive. So I just changed this my signs a little bit. But actually change our answer rather drastically. Okay, it's just gonna make that a positive value. So I have um 19.6 minus 10 we get 9.6 newtons is the force of friction. So now that we have a value for the force of friction, our last step, we're gonna plug it into the work equation so that we know the work done by the force of friction must be equal to the force of friction. equation there we go force of friction dot the displacement which in this case is s our variable s so you want to pay attention to the component of the force of friction that's technically parallel and that's all of it 9.6 newtons times the displacement which is 20 meters times the cosine, technically the angle between this force of friction vector and the displacement vector, right? The displacement vector, if we, if we were represented as a vector, it's gonna look, right, like this. They're in opposite directions, so the angle between them would be 180 degrees. So we need to plug in 180 degrees for theta. 
That will give us a negative value for work, which we know is factual because friction removes energy from the system. We get negative 192 joules. Um, that difference there is most likely due to, I'm still using 9.8 because it's more exact, um, but if we use 10 for G, we'll probably get exactly um, negative 190 newtons, or joules rather. Okay, so that's the work done by friction. Another way in which we could do it, any ideas? We could use the fact that work equals the change in mechanical energy. Network equals the change in mechanical energy. Um, we could find the network and then the work done by the X component of the force of gravity and then subtract them. Um, but this way works just as well and it's the method that we've been using from the previous problems. So we're going to stick to it. Alrighty, so that's it for those questions that were asked. Um, I will see you guys soon.